You are listening to the Outside the Boards podcast. I'm Danny O'Leary. For most of my professional career, I have worked in mainstream sports for some of the world's leading sports organizations and properties and blue chip brands, helping to create award-winning omni-channel marketing campaigns, result-driven sales strategies, and impactful brand building initiatives. But all that work doesn't compare to the fun, excitement, and challenges I've been fortunate to experience working for the king of all sports, Polo. For nearly a decade, I've put my heart and ambition into helping advance the sport of polo. I've made lifelong friendships, met some incredible people, traveled to memorable polo destinations, and heard the craziest stories. My goal is to share these people, places, and stories with you and provide a unique behind-the-scenes perspective of the game that breaks all the common stereotypes, all while discussing key issues affecting the sport today and the constructive sharing of ideas, insights, solutions, and best case studies for the purpose of advancing polo globally. Every week, I will have honest conversations with polo industry leaders, enthusiasts, and awe-inspiring people who make this sport great and fun to be around. I hope through their knowledge and their unique perspectives, they will motivate and inspire you. Together, we will explore ways you can make small tweaks to boost your polo business, whether you are a club, event, team, or player, that will amount to big changes in revenue, participation, attendance, and exposure. Saddle up. Welcome to Outside the Boards with me, Daniel Leary. Daniel Leary here, and welcome to Season 3 of the Outside the Boards podcast. On this episode of the Outside the Boards, I'm really excited to introduce you to one of Polo's global leaders in the sport, Mr. Alex Taylor, Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of International Polo and last year's FIP World Championships Tournament Director. Prior to joining the FIP in 2015, many had known Alex Taylor from his years as a Council Administration member and treasurer of the Argentine Association of Polo. He has extensive commercial experience and during his time as CEO of FIP, he had been the power behind ensuring that the FIP bylaws are finally compliant with the Uruguay Authority's requirements, working with the AAP, USPA, and HPA on the international rules, and of course the outstanding success of the recent FIP 10th World Championships in the United States and Florida. Alex grew up around polo at the iconic Tortuga Country Club, influenced by his father and uncle. He would pick up the mail and begin playing between the ages of 6 and 7 and purchase for his first horse at 28, playing chuckers whenever he could. Today, Alex lives 400 kilometers south of Buenos Aires on his farm while leading the sport's world governing body. Alex has been a part of Polo's global expansion and organization since the very beginning. Despite the sport's age, the global organization of the game is still very young, and it's amazing to listen of its rapid growth. Sometimes we forget how truly global the game is today. With Alex at the helm, this is all changing. So let's get started, everyone. Enjoy. Alex Taylor, how are you doing today, man? Very well, thank you. Nice to be here. I'm excited to have you on after a successful world championship here in America in Wellington. And hopefully the dust has settled from that. But you know, coming to a close to the Argentine polo season and I'm eager to talk a little bit more about that and obviously your background with polo. And I think you were once the tournament director for FIP and now have taken the role of CEO. But that was uh, since, what, 2015, I think? No, I started as CEO in 2014. 2014. Oh, I was off by a year. <laughs> but I've been involved with FIP since the 2000s. Oh, my gosh. Many, many years uh, involved with FIP and with polo in general. So where are you talking to me from right now? Are you in Argentina right now? I'm in Argentina. I'm on a farm, which is uh, 400 kilometers south of Buenos Aires. Wonderful. Wonderful. So has the craziness still going on down there after your World Cup win? Yes, it was crazy, absolutely crazy uh, all over the country, especially in Buenos Aires. And the team is arriving tomorrow, Tuesday morning. So um, we don't know what's going to happen. I think it's going to be Buenos Aires is going to be shut down again because they're going to parade and all of that. So, yeah, it's going to be crazy for a couple of days. Just how they do it when a team wins a Super Bowl here in America. They pretty much shut down the town, have their parade. But this is a bigger deal. Obviously, they don't have this thing every year. This is every four years. Yeah, this is every four years. No, yesterday, and, and Argentina hadn't won a World Polo Championship for the last 36 years. So, yesterday, uh, there were o- over 2 million people out on the streets in Buenos Aires. Well, congratulations to you guys down there. That's awesome. We, Thank you. My whole crew, family and all that, we are all 
leaning towards Argentina. We wanted to see them win. We're big friends of uh, Messi, so it's exciting to see and watching him win was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, between polo and soccer, Argentina has a lot to celebrate. You know, absolutely. <laughs> uh, not to say that La Delfina or anything like that was, you know, the odds were against them, but needless to say, that's really, really exciting stuff for two major sports in your country and taking the trophy home. That's for sure. Absolutely. So tell me, Alex, what are your roots in polo? Let's go way back. You know, as I talk with everyone who comes on this podcast, you know, I'm really interested to learn about people's entry into the sport. And some people, it's a dynasty thing. You know, they're second, third, fourth, fifth year generation into the sport. Their parents played it or were involved in some other equestrian sport. Or there's people who have jumped into it in their late 30s, early 40s, when they had a discretionary income to kind of kickstart a hobby like this. So you're Argentine, so you're much closer to the sport than a lot of Americans that I've spoken to. But where are your roots? Where does it all start? Well, it's a, a mix of what you just said. My father and my uncle played, and I was born in a polo club, Tortugas Country Club. So we lived there forever. So I was familiar with polo since a very, very young kid. But then my father abandoned it. I was passionate. So I always continued trying to play polo wherever I want. But uh, I could start uh, only when I was 28 years old. I could buy my first horses and started playing seriously, let's say. Not just stealing chakras here and there. Now, did anyone play before your father? No, no, no. No? No, my, my father and, and, and my uncle were there. But that was, we were talking many, many, many years ago. You said your, your father abandoned it. What was his reasons for abandoning the game? One was uh, physical. He had a heart attack. Um, oh, okay. But my, my uncle continued to play, so I was always close to that. And in Tortuga, there was always polo, so I always got to steal chuckers here and there. And that's how I got started and as a young kid. And then more seriously, when I was 20. So that was many, mm -hmm. many years ago, also ago, because I, that what happened in 1980. So at what age were you on a horse with a mallet? I'm always curious. About six, seven years old. Okay. My daughter just uh, started riding lessons at the age, well, just before she turned seven. And because she's taking riding lessons at a polo club, naturally, they're going to put a mallet in her hand. So, But it's uh, <laughs> so important and people many times uh, disregard that, especially let's say late bloomers. Um, you know, the most important thing is to learn how to ride a horse and don't even have to think that you're on a horse. Now, you know, growing up in Argentina, and I had a very interesting conversation this with Fred Mannix, and we talked about why you know, there's so many Argentine polo players in today's sport. The horse culture in Argentina is much more accessible in your country than any other place in the world. You know, when you were growing up, did your uncle or dad own a farm? Another uncle, yes. So I spent all summers in, in the farm of another uncle. Okay. Uh, the horse culture, you know, I think if you think about going to back in time, horses were fundamental for our life, communication, transport, and war. Yeah. And that was maybe until 60 or 70 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, cavalry was the most important part of, a, of, of an army. So I think that was that culture was worldwide. And Argentina had uh, you know, the facilities of having a, enormous access to horses, a lot of farmland, and very easy to build a polo field because it's very flat. I don't know if you've been to Argentina, but it's incredibly flat. So you can start a polo field anywhere with very little money. And so it, I don't know how you say it in English, but it's like you know football here. Uh, your soccer, our football here is so, so easy because you can play it in every pot. We call it a potrero, you know, in any small piece of grass, you can play soccer. And polo is the same. You go in the interior to the small towns and then and kids after school just hop on a horse and start hitting an, a ball with a mallet, you know. In, in, and you don't have to have a proper expensive polo field irrigated and boards and all of that. See, that's interesting. Like, my question was more, you know, in terms of the, the polo and accessibility is like to, in recent times, absolutely. You know, the horse is role in every other country, and especially in the United States, played a huge role. Absolutely. And then things already obviously started to shift post World War II, technology boom, and so on and so forth. And, you know, Oak Brook, you know, which I manage, yeah, I did not know this, but in 1922, I learned from Paul Butler's descendants and children that Oak Brook was primarily set up as more of a means for training cavalry officers. 
and other countries filtered through Oak Brook, including Cuba and, and others for that very purpose. Because at that time, Calvaries were still very much part of military back then, mm -hmm. communications and, and what have you. But you mentioned something very interesting in terms of Polo and Argentina. It's very flat there. It's very easy to build a field. But well, you also mentioned, you know, kids going to school and after they can come and they can just jump on a horse sort of thing. But it also seems it's just the horses in general beyond just the, you know, the building of polo fields that that's accessible too. And I'm assuming the cost is much lower to do so for a young kid versus here in the U.S. I don't know, because uh, in the U.S. you have a, a big tradition with horses, and especially, you know, in the Midwest and all of that. So, but, but you have other sports that, you know, rodeo and all that that we don't have as much as you have. Yeah. We have rodeo, but in a very, it's not as popular as, as your rodeo. So I think Polo especially took up initially very, very big in, in the Buenos Aires, uh, province of Buenos Aires and around the city of Buenos Aires, where all the English were established. I think it was a combination of the English being here and basically you know, grazing and farming English companies for all the meat that they were producing mm -hmm. and the flatness of, the English all played polo. People that rode played polo. And immediately our army also, you know, the, in their infantry, uh, you went to any regiment in Argentina and they, all of them have polo fields. And they helped a lot to develop, you know, breeds, you know, polo breeding and all of that. So it was a combination of things that made uh, the, uh, the perfect combination for polo to develop. Because, yeah, in the U.S., obviously, there's hotbeds throughout the country, you know, from raising cattle and cowboy culture and you go down to Kentucky and you have the racing culture down there. Obviously, Wellington built itself up into, you know, the World Equestrian Festival and Polo. There's no doubt about it. So if you're obviously in those areas, no question about it that it's going to be accessible more so in those areas versus even in here in Chicago. It's still not as accessible. Oak Brook is the closest, but our academy is 30 to 45 minutes outside the city. And, you know, those are the population centers. That's where people work. That's people play. There's far less of that in the very Western suburbs, less of a population pool. So it's interesting. And not to mention what we have to compete against, it's pretty extensive. <laughs> but it's, it's always interesting to learn about why one sport does better in a country or a specific location versus another. And all the cultural, economical factors that all play into it. If you were to examine in basketball, for example, like why is basketball such a more popular sport because putting a basketball court or a half court on concrete is a very easy to do in very high level metropolitan areas mm -hmm. versus in the western suburbs where you have soccer for the most part where you have open green fields that's why lacrosse and soccer are probably more popular in the western suburbs and basketball sort of thing it's interesting to learn about all of those types of things and it, it applies here i think with polo and in Argentina, there's no question about it. Yeah, I think Argentina had the perfect ingredients. And add to that, that turn of the century, 1930s, 40s, 50s, Argentina was incredibly rich. And especially because of farmlands and grazing, so, and cattle and cereal. So I think that also helped Polo to develop because it was easier to do it here. It was always cost money, but then there were also there was the money to play and teams to travel abroad. In. Yeah. So it was a combination. It was a perfect ingredients all the way here, and it just it worked for everybody. Absolutely, and it still works to this day. Well, now it does it more than ever, probably. Uh, yeah. Because when professionalism started in Argentina, it was very easy to develop and to continue. See, the best professionals in the world come here to play here. It doesn't matter if you're from Uruguay or you know, Freddie Mannix from Canada or guys from South Africa or the States. They all come to play here. And all our professionals play around the world, uh, make money abroad, and then they spend it in Argentina. So it's... Play and it's breed now. The ingredients still play in favor of Argentina every time more and more. Uh, I got to get down there. I have yet to visit. I've been invited so many times and just has not been able to pull the trigger yet. Because when I do, I want to bring down my whole entire family. <laughs> but no, let's, let's get back to you, Alex. So you said 19 is when you started to really pick up the sport. Seriously, or was that in your 20s? No, I was 28 years old. First okay. time I, I went into a polo field, a proper game, was 28 years old. Okay, got it, got it. But you were riding before that. Oh, yes. So what ultimately kind of got you hooked to the game at the end of the day? So you, you, you started to really play at 28. What happened from there? No, it, it really happened. It, it was a passion for me. 
I was always very into sports. I did a lot of sports, but polo was my passion. Mm -hmm. You know, the relationship with the horses, it's not just going playing a game, it's an everyday thing, you know, being after the horses, looking at them, training, training the horses and then playing. So the, the mixture of things, you know, horses, you know, the ambience, the friends, all of that went into it. Who were you playing along with back then? Well, always you play uh, at the clubs, the way the, the pole is organized in Argentina. Our club is in very close to Buenos Aires. You know, Tortugas is one of the clubs of the, of the Triple Crown, mm -hmm. together with Hurlingham and Palermo, the, the Open. So I always saw very good polo there. We had very good polo fields. And I always played the Argentine Polo Association tournaments and the two seasons, the spring season and our autumn season. And you make different teams with different friends, and all, all from the club. Back then, Tortugas, polo-wise, was probably one of the two or three largest polo clubs in Buenos Aires. So depends on the level of the tournament. It was at 12 gold or 18 gold or 20 gold. You made teams with different friends. Back then, there was no professionalism, so it was all friends. You just pick up the phone and are you free to play? You want to play next month or the other month or whatever, and you organize your season. So it was very easy to do it also. So then if professional polo really didn't exist around that time when you're 20, when did that change? There was no professional polo in Argentina. Some polo players started going out with invitations. I say in the late 80s is when the professionalism, as you know it today, started. To give you an idea, in the early 90s, for example, players in the Argentine Open could not have any publicity on their shirts. I think it was 1988, 89, 90, when for the first time the AAP authorized teams to have a sponsor and then they had a very small sign or whatever logo in, in the shirts. Mm -hmm. And that's when it all started. And then players were going out, traveling abroad, invited, but they were not paid. They were taking horses and selling the horses and that's how they made some money. But in the late 80s, early 90s, that's when professional events started. That's not that long ago. I feel like... No. Wow. So for, for organized professional polo did not happen in Argentina until the late 80s. Yeah, and then the first ones were uh, that I remember of that came here as, and hired professionals were Americans. You know, Peter Brand, White Birch, and Gonzalo Pieres, who was, you know, the best example of a super professional in polo and invented, I think, professionals in polo was Gonzalo Pieres. Yeah. Or perfected it, you know, and, uh, and he still does. So, yes, yeah, as, as you say, it's very, very region. Yeah. So then how the Argentine Polo Open, which is the mecca of tournaments within our sport, when did all that kind of start to formulate that? Was that very quick or? Many, many, many years ago, much before professionalism. Because the Argentine Polo Association operated Palermo and owned uh, polo fields in Pilar and organized the tournaments. And, and most of the polo during the, the big season, which is spring, happened around Buenos Aires. So they organized tournaments on monthly basis for August, September, October, November into until the open in mid-December. And you played one tournament after the other. And if you made it to the finals, then your final was played in Palermo. So that was a big, big attraction. Whatever level of polo you were playing, you know, 10 goals, 12 goals, 15, 20 goals, you ended playing in Palermo. So that's how the polo season was always organized. And then you had, of course, polo in the interior in different provinces, but 90% of the polo was played around BA. My gosh, that's just it's a very, very interesting history right there. And for you to be in the thick of it. What goal level did you get to as a player? Four goals. And were you traveling around the world or were you? was it mostly in Argentina? No, I, I played in Argentina. I was not a professional. I always spend money. I never made money at a polo. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, I mean, as a four goal or one like today, would kind of can be considered a professional player. Nah, but back in those days, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only ones that got paid in the early 90s was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten goalers. So then you're essentially an amateur player then at four goals. You know, this was your passion. What were you doing professionally back then? Oh, I so always worked in, in business, the banking industry for many, many years, and then as a consultant. Okay. So doing business consulting in the last 30, 40 years of my life. And at that time, were you also just very much involved in the sport from an association side, from a club side? Both. I started in the club in Tortugas, in the Polo Commission of Tortugas. And then in the early 90s, I was invited to join the Argentine Polo Association and different committees. And so that's how I got, got involved in the management of polo, let's say, to put it in a way. So I was in the 90s for six years. 
And then 2009, 2010 again for another five years in the Argentine Port Association. And through the Argentine Port Association, I formed part of FIP. That's how it started. Okay. In the 98, when the World Polo Championship took place in the United States in Santa Barbara, I was the manager of the Argentine Polo team there mm -hmm. to help that. And so that's how I got involved with FIP. And then when I was back in the AAP and the Argentine Polo Association in 2009, 2010, they asked me to be their representative in FIP. So that's how I got involved with more seriously with FIP, let's say. Outside the Board Season 3 podcast is presented by the United States Polo Association. The United States Polo Association is organized and exists for the purpose of promoting the game of polo, coordinating the activities of its member clubs and registered player members, arranging and supervising polo tournaments, competitions, and games, and providing rules, handicaps, and tournament conditions for those events. Its overarching goals are improving the sport and promoting the safety and welfare of its human and equine participants. Founded in 1890, the USP is the largest voluntary sports organization in North America for the sport of polo. The USP is currently made up of more than 200 member clubs and over 5,000 registered player members. It annually awards and oversees roughly 50 national tournaments hosted by its member clubs. For more information, please visit uspolo.org. So now I'm intrigued now because you were around FIP from its very, very beginning and contributed to its roots. What triggered the development of an international organization? It all started by an Argentinian, Marco Suranga, which is mm -hmm. the, the founder, and Glenn Holden. Yeah. Santa Barbara, and you know they were friends, and they traveled around the world playing polo, and said, let's create a federation that brings together all the associations and try to promote polo and try to unify the rules back then, the rules between you know, America, England, and Argentina were quite different. But basically the idea was to create this international polo community and share values and make friends and travel. And that was how it all started. Now was the world championship part of its roots back then too, that formation? It was formed in 1982, the FIP, and the first world polo championship was played in 1987. So when they started Originally, there were 11 associations that formed part of FIP. So they said, how do we grow? And so they, they, they came with this idea of creating the World Polo Championship in a handicap level that was accessible to more countries in the world. Because if you need a, a really World Polo Championship with every team, let's say something that is, would be impossible or practically impossible, travel with your own horses and the best players, Argentina would win every, every time. So they invented this creative formula of limiting the handicap and the horse sharing. So that made it very, very competitive to everybody and everybody can have a chance to win it. So we had 12 World Polo Championships and Argentina won five. So I think uh, that, that's really worked for, for FIP and for the promotion of FIP. And then that formula is applied in the European Championship. And of course, now in the Women's Championship is also the formula of sharing the horses. So the, the horses are pooled and then those pools are drawn by the teams and teams have a, less than a day, a couple of hours to get familiarized with the horses and and then you start playing. I want to dive into that, Alex, because I come from mainstream sports and talking about polo with them is, is always very interesting. And oftentimes people always ask me, oh, Dan, how many horses are playing and so on and so forth. And I kind of walk them through, all right, this is what we play on the amateur mid goal and then high goal. And they use our, you know, Wellington as an example in terms of member of horses. And they're like, what the heck? How many, you have that many horses per team? I said, yeah. It's a very interesting business behind the scenes of how it all kind of works together. But then we get into the World Championships with FIP, and that's a whole entire different because it's like, well, you're sharing of horses. So where do all those horses come from? In the traditional sense, it's always the players. But now we're in a different route. Can you walk us through, because you were the tournament director for a very long time with FIP, right? Before you became the CEO? And still I am. <laughs> it's two different things, okay? I've been tournament director in, in many tournaments and the last three World Polo Championships, and at the same time, I'm CEO. So it's, it's two different things, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we have other tournament directors. Depending which part of the world the events are happening, we have tournament directors in, in Asia or in Europe or here, other people have been tournament directors over the history. Yeah. Several people can be tournament directors. The CEO position was created in 2014, and I... 
joined first for a year, was asked to, to take that position first for a year because we had to organize a World Polo Championship in Chile. And after that, they said, okay, we need this to be a permanent position. And there was an international search and I also participated in that search. And since then, I'm FIP is stuck with me. <laughs> and the tournament director is another thing, is the same as all the master. But let me walk through the, the, the whole process. Yeah. In 1987, when you had the first World Polo Championship, all the horses were lent by players. So Argentine players lend the horses to FIP. Then FIP names a horse master. And this horse master with a team of assistants makes as many sets of horses as teams are going to participate. So just to take an example of, of the last World Polo Championship in, in the States, we had eight teams and each team received 21 horses. Okay, so you had 168 horses that were distributed in eight equal strings of 21 horses. The key question here is horses. What is the most important thing in the World Polo Championship? Horses. Yeah. And second horses and third horses. But also you don't need to have, they started with over 180 horses to have these 168 horses that were pooled in eight as similar as possible pools. And then there's a draft and all the, all the teams in the first day and there is a draw and you draw for pool A, B, C, D, whatever. And then you have a couple of hours to ride the horses and then distribute them among the four players and then play a very short practice game so that to be sure on how, the way you've distributed the horses. So it's a question of who has the ability to get to know and interpret you know, the horses as better. Of course, we give you additional information. We tell this horse plays this kind of polo, this level. The owner is a one goaler, five goaler, plays number one and two, three, four. Mm -hmm. So that helps you to redistribute, but then it's the ability of the player and the coach to redistribute the horses in the best possible way. So the players don't get an opportunity to ride the horses. You're just providing them background information as to who they are, where they came from, what level they're playing at, and so on and so forth, right? The coach distributes the horses initially. They yeah. ride them, each horse, five, six, seven minutes. I say, no, I like this, I don't like this, and they change around. And then they play the same day or the next day, depending on the organization, the logistics, a practice game which is uh, three to four minute chuckers, uh, just to get to know the horses and see, okay, I feel f comfortable with this or I want to change this. And then after that, the next day, you start the games. Okay. So that's going into the championship. How do then the different zones do it? Most of them do it exactly the same way, except Europe, that because of the proximity of the countries one to the other, each team travels with their own horses. Okay. Last year, we had it in France, in Chantilly, close to Paris. So Spain, you know, came from Spain and Italy from Italy. And so they would travel there. It's easier to do it because the longest haul may be a thousand kilometers, which would be a two days haul. Okay. Not that complicated. But if you had to do it in, let's say, South America, you do it in Argentina, you had to fly horses from Peru or from Chile, or which would be not only expensive, but also very complicated with the quarantine. Mm -hmm. That would be the big issue, you know, the 30 or 40 days of horse uh, before game. So it would be logistically, practically, and economically impossible to do it. That's why this format works. No, I agree. I mean, it levels the playing field too. It levels absolutely. And then it, another of the purposes of FIP is also about camaraderie, friendship, sharing. And so generally all players stay at the same place in the same hotel. So you have your breakfast, lunch, everybody's together. It doesn't matter where you come from or your team or whatever you are in. Everybody becomes friends with everybody. And that also helps a lot in everything. In the, the, the way the game is played, the conduct, as an example, the last World Polo Championship, we had only two yellow cards because of behavior. Okay. Mm -hmm. All of the others, you know, because of fouls or whatever, but because of the game, not because of misbehavior, you know, uh, and that is part of that, you know, that friendship and that camaraderie that generates amongst all the players. What goes into the selection process of the host country? What we do is open a selection, a process, uh, and this has changed over the years, where whoever wants to be the host comes with a proposal, then this is shared with all the other full member associations that have the, the right to be the host. And then we only had two times in the 12 editions of the World Polo Championship where we had competing nations, let's say. So one was in 2017 between the United States and Australia, and then now in 22, between the United States and Pakistan. So 
it's a very straightforward process where they propose and whoever proposes and everybody else is informed, you know, that United States has a proposed, make your bid. And generally we work together with each association to everybody understands what it takes uh, to organize a World Polo Championship. And then the General Assembly decides. Now, where will it be held next? Next will be in 2026. And we had uh, during the General Assembly that we had two weeks ago, we had two potential associations that would be interested to hold it. One was uh, Dubai and the other one is Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. Okay. We are already working with them, but uh, providing them all the basic information they need. But we will be working all them all through next year. And the idea is in the General Assembly of next year to have the, the host selected. And at what goal level is the World Champions being played at? 10 to 14 goals. And so when you guys started the World Championship, did it kick off with four zones immediately? Or because I know you no. added E. No, no, no. I think the first World Polo Championship was six or seven teams with no zones. And then zones started to evolve, and now we have five zones. As I told you at the beginning, we only had 11 associations, and now we have 50 associations that are full members and another 20-something associations that are corresponding members. But we have a, really not 50 because not all associations can field a 10-goal team. But yeah. we have approximately around 30 associations that can field a 10-goal team. Wow, that is fantastic. Serious growth in a sport like polo in that many years or that many championships, which when you calculate it all, it's not very many. No. So that's impressive. Now, how does the zone park work in terms of qualifying for the world championships? Each zone, uh, there is zone directors and the same process as the World Polo Championship before the playoffs. Host association in Europe or North America or South America or Southeast Asia propose to be the host. Then they can provide the polo fields, the horses, and come up with a proposal, then they organize it. As I said, the easiest one is Europe because everybody travels with their own horses. But for this one, in January of this year, we had four teams participating in Uruguay. It was Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay. Argentina did not have to participate because they were last champions, so they were already qualified for the finals. Mm -hmm. So the host country provides the horses, and it's the same process. So they had over 100 horses, then we split, I think it was 88 horses, because 22 per team. And we play, in this case, was four chucker games. Could be four chuckers, could be five chuckers. In the States, we had eight teams divided in two zones. Everybody played three games within their zone. And number one and number two zone played cross semifinals. So for the first stage of qualifying, let's say, every team played four, uh, four chuckers per game. And then as four teams drop out, because only two qualify of, of its own, the horses of the four teams that not continue to play were redistributed with other teams, and then they played five chuckers for the semifinals and the final. Now, is it a format where everyone's playing each other at least once? No. You play against each other in your zone. You play three games in your zone, and then it's semifinals, semifinal and final. Got it. This is interesting. I'm always curious as to how this whole entire thing works. So what's the next step after that? So you qualify for your zone. Is there one zone in particular that has the most difficulty in terms of organizing? You have Europe, which is the easiest. But I'm assuming that countries that or areas that are much further away from each other is very difficult. Yeah, they, of course, they're easier and they're more difficult, but basically not because of the physical separation or geographical separation, because it, but it's the ability to host and have that amount of horses that you need to have. That would be the big question. Mm -hmm. So in South America, Peru has organized it, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, Europe, all of them have organized zone playoffs. In North America, the state has several times. We did it in Dominican Republic many years, and Mexico did it this year. This time, it's more difficult in zones like Southeast Asia because basically they are only Australia and New Zealand could do it. Malaysia did it many years ago. That, that's not easy. And then in the zone E, which is uh, Africa, Middle East, and India and Pakistan, Iran did it in 2017. And this year we had geopolitical problems there in that area. Yeah. So we were able to organize it thanks to the collaboration of uh, the South African Polo Association and especially two clubs that, that provided the polo fields and the, and the horses. It was the Inanda Polo Club and East Rand Polo Club. They did a fantastic job in organizing. So that's, that's one of the most difficult zones to get it organized. So let's summarize. How did this past year's World Championships go? Big success? Amazing success. The event was fantastic. First, we had all the zones. You, knew, you remember that we're coming out of, of the pandemic. Uh, yeah. A lot of 
problems and limitations to organize. You know, now at the end of 22, probably is easier. But at the beginning of 22, when this all had to start, we're coming out of 21, which was still in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we had to organize this with a lot of time in advance to get, you know, teams compromises to participate, horses and all of that. So to be able to do it and to have teams participating and competing in each of the five zones. And then eight, so eight teams made it to the United States and we had a, an amazing World Polo Championship where everybody was more than happy with everything, the organization, the horse, the polo fields, everything. Everything went more than perfect. Now, aside from obviously Spain winning it all, what were some of the big highlights or accomplishments? Is Was there the viewership, the engagement, anything like that? Was there more people in tune to watching the world championships all over the world? With regards to watching, yes, because it's now it's much easier to watch polo around the world because, uh, you know, the way it's filmed and transmitted and you can watch it on the phone or you can watch it on your iPad or whatever. But then also, I think it was a big surprise in the States for the, the, the USPA, the amount of people that traveled, you know, how much public there was in every game. They were really impressed about that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the teams, they were you know, impressed of the quality of the polo fields and the horses. The horses were really amazing. The J5 organization provided superb horses. And our horse master was Adam Snow, a very good friend of mine. You know, he's a genius and with horses and the, the way he, he handled everything, that was great. So everybody was very, very happy. And one of the semifinals went to overtime and the final went to overtime. So that speaks how, how equal the horses were spread out and how equal the teams were, you know, and what uh, the, the quality of the players. And National Polo Center, formerly IPC, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful venue. It's so perfect and ideal for spectators to really watch and enjoy the game. And even J5, you know, Valiente. Valiente yeah. also you know, has great, fantastic polo fields. And mm -hmm. we're, we're very lucky with the weather because three days after the final, we had a huge storm sweeping through West Palm Beach. So <laughs> I think over you know, 200 millimeters fell down in a day. So that was about... 40 inches of water. Like that. So, but everything went perfect. So we are very, very happy with the way it went. That's fantastic. And then you know, you, you're asking some of the highlights. You know, first, it's not the first time that a woman participates in a World Polo Championship because we had a one before, uh, but it was the first time that a woman makes it to the semifinals and the finals. Hope? Yeah, Hope Arellano. So, so having a, a lady in, you know, playing the semifinals and the finals is a first-timer in, in the history of polo and in FIP. And then it's the first time that the trophy leaves uh, America because always the winners have been United States, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. And for the first time, it leaves America and goes to Europe with the win of Spain. So that's also a, a first-timer. Yeah, and those speak volumes in terms of the sport progressing over the world. You have more equal play among different countries so they can field competitive teams. Obviously, the horse situation seems to be very streamlined and so on and so forth to make it very fair across the board. That's great. And hopefully for the future, it's going to you know jump hands and go to different parts of the world because what almost half of the world championships are Argentine. Well, now it's uh, five out of 12. And I think going to Europe, I think if, you know, Spain has been working on their national team for many, many years. Uh, they had the same coach, I think now for 12 or 14 years. And that speaks of that, you know, of a continuity, of a process, of a project, which is really fantastic. So, yeah, we, we are really, as I said, very, very happy with, with everything, with what happened, the way it finished, uh, who won, everything. Makes up. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Thank you. So what's next on the calendar for the FIP? Well, next year we have the European Championship and both the Mixed Polo and the Ladies Championship. That's in July in Italy, in Puntala, and in September in Dusseldorf, in Germany. We have the Polo Rider Cup, which is a tournament that we endorse, which is the teams competing represent clubs around the world. So that's uh, going very, very well. And we use that also to innovate in the rules of polo in that tournament. And also next year, or as I said, uh, working on the who's going to be the host of the next World Polo Championship. Now, are there a certain projects, tournaments, or what have you, that you're personally interested in or would love to see happen with FIP's leadership? What we're trying to do and trying to get is the European Championship, that format, to be applied in different zones, the same format. So not only to have the European Championship, but have something similar to that, uh, let's say the South American or North American or whatever 
are starting to promote that. And next year, we have a proposal of Egyptian Polo Association to organize an African tournament in Egypt with African nations participating. So that's what we are trying to see. We can find a format that could work for that, that make it financially accessible. So we're trying to work that with all the zones and see what, what ideas we have with zones. Probably not the same format as the European or the World Polo Championship, but more like, I don't know how familiar you are with football, you know, not your football, um, like the Champions League, you know, where let's say they would be in, in your zone, you know, Canada goes to the United States and play two games, and then the United States go to Mexico and plays one, and then something like that. So that you only have to mount two teams and not four or six teams at a time. So that's why we're working on those ideas to see if we can starting to have that happen in the future. Is it similar to what CONCACAF does here? Yeah. Yeah. Was it the CONCACAF Gold Cup? Is that what it's usually called here? Well, the teams travel to one country or to the other instead of all getting to the other. Now you had the finals of the World the Football Championship. Where everybody was there for a month and a half. Uh -huh. In order to qualify to get there, you know, Argentina played Brazil and Brazil and Brazil played Argentina and Argentina and Argentina played Chile and played, you know, so and Europe played amongst the European countries, but not all to got together for two weeks in London to play everybody against each other. They traveled and played one game or two games. So kind of that idea. So that, that would be much easier to do because what you need to do is just to mount two teams at a time. Yeah. So whoever is the host can mount their team in another one and then they play the second game in, in the other country or wherever or they swap polylines which mm -hmm. is what we did, for example, we did in the playoffs in Mexico, between Mexico and Guatemala. We had two sets of horses and we swapped the, the, the pony lines. So mm -hmm. one game you played with one set of horses and then the other game you played with the other set of horses. So everybody had the chance to play with the same horses. Got it. Outside the Board Season 3 podcast is presented by the National Polo Center Wellington. The National Polo Center in Wellington, Florida is located in the heart of South Florida's legendary horse country. The permanent home for polo in America, NPC is owned and managed by the United States Polo Association to showcase the finest the sport has to offer. The association's premier event, the Gauntlet of Polo, takes place from February to April each winter season. Throughout the year, the facilities are also used to showcase USPA member clubs and prestigious national tournament competition. Watching polo from the stadium, private boxes, fieldside tailgates, or special hospitality tents, all overlooking the U.S. Polo ASSN Field 1 is an unparalleled experience. NPC invites you to enjoy the best polo in the country, taking place at one of the most beautiful venues in the world, the National Polo Center Wellington. For more information, visit nationalpolocenter.com. So this is interesting in terms of just what the FIP would like to see or would like to see organized. Is there anything else from a non-tournament perspective that you would like to see in a sport on a global basis or within certain regions, uh, you know, like the commercial side of things? I cannot get into the commercial side. It's not my expertise and it's very difficult and it's uh, complicated depending on, on the zones and potential sponsors. But we have a commercial agent in FIP now that we're trying to work with them in seeing what is needed to make it more attractive commercially so that it would help to bring money to the sport. Money not from patrons, but from sponsors. Yeah. One of the things that we believe is simplifying the polar rules and for understanding of everybody and making the game more, let's say, more attractive to the watcher, which is where we have some things to adjust. So we're working on that. We're working with the three big in you know, Argentina, England, and uh, United States Polo Associations in discussing this and making some changes to the format. And we're using some of those changes with the Ryder Cup. So that's what, something that we're working on, trying to you know, make it faster, not so many interruptions. So we're working on, on some ideas, and maybe some of them will be putting them in practice this year in the Ryder Cup. And then, no, we're very happy with what's happened with the rules. We had a very good meeting. We, every year we meet all the, the three big and the FIP. Yeah, that just recently happened, didn't it? We had a meeting during the Open. Present there, we had uh, FIP, SPA, and AAP, and via Zoom, HPA. But about three hours meeting, and we discuss different topics and different rules and interpretation. But now, rules are practically the same. What happens within the boards is the same in the three, in the three big. There's practically no differences there. So we are very happy with that. That's uh, many years of working together, all of, all of associations, and we are all very, very happy with the results because we exchange all our experiences. We've seen what works and what doesn't work, and 
I think that has improved the game a lot. Mm -hmm. And then basically from FIP, what we like is to promote the beginning of players. And we do that by our Polo Development Fund, which is funded mostly by the International Olympic Committee. And we help associations in putting together these development programs for beginners, for kids, and for not so many beginners, uh, a bit older, but also rules and behavior and all of that. So that's what we really focused in every year. Do you feel as though polo will return as an Olympic sport? That's going to be very, very difficult if it ever happens, but we're working on having polo as a showcasing sport. We yeah. were able to accomplish that in 2018 in Argentina during the Youth Olympic Games. Of course, every for every Olympic, we put our request to be accepted as a showcasing sport. Mm -hmm. We might have a possibility in Los Angeles. I don't know. But where we were working very well is with Cortina 2026 uh, Winter Games. But we have a very good relationship with the IOC. We are recognized association by the IOC. Mm -hmm. uh, we receive funding from them. Our aim is to participate in the Olympics as a showcasing sport. Yeah. Well, I hope definitely for Los Angeles. I mean, my gosh, California does have a good rooted history. I mean, Santa Barbara, you know, and obviously Empire, sadly, is no longer. But, you know, there's some great history there of the people involved. So I really hope that it does get considered as a showcase sport. That would be a lot of fun. In terms of going back to the commercialization of the sport, it was with the USPA. Actually, uh, when Chile hosted it back in 2014, and my gosh, within the last less than 10 years, I mean, so much has changed around the sport, especially from the ability to view the game. You know, I remember when USPA was on ESPN talking about how drone technology has helped polo more so than anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I mean, from a spectator, not just from a, an umpiring standpoint, but just watching the game, it's just incredible to see them from high above at such high speeds. And my prior life in mainstream sports, I mean, when I send them videos, they're just amazed by it. And they, they immediately fall in love with it. And every time they're venturing down to Florida or anywhere else, sometimes they'll give me a call like, hey, you know, where's the nearest polo club? I want to take my wife or my family out to do something during the day. And they're just, you know, enthralled with it all now, which is great. Yeah, I think that that's the way to go. And of course, all this new technology has helped a lot. Back in the days of when I was in the Argentine Polo Association and we were discussing with ESPN, I said, look, the, the most expensive sport to broadcast is golf because we have to have dozens of cameras all around the golf course. And the second one is polo. Mm -hmm. And that has changed uh, dramatically for us. You know, cameras are smaller, lighter, or easier to transport, and, yeah, and they have the drones. So now with two or three small cameras and a drone, you have a fantastic shooting of a, of a polo game. Are there any countries in the world that you're seeing a lot of growth in? Anything new to FIP? It changes. It's been a continued growth. Argentina continues to grow. It's incredible. And then we see new countries uh, joining us. You know, we have requests from Luxembourg, Ecuador, Korea, you know, Southeast Asia is growing. Polo is taking part of the Southeast Asian Games, and that's a close relative of the Olympics. And of course, the area of polo that's growing the most is uh, women's polo. That is exploding all over the world. And that's the biggest driver today in polo. Oh, yeah. So women's polo is growing. We had uh, this year, this last year, we also had the first Women's World Polo Championship. And we are aiming at having the, the next one in 2024 in Thailand. Oh, wow. Great. So, so that's very, very, very attractive. But then the other thing is that we believe that we don't define polo, only the polo that is played on horseback, on a grass polo field, you know, arena polo, snow polo, now this wheel polo, you know, the roda polo. I'm sure you've seen some of that. Mm -hmm. Bicycle, everything that, that you use, use a mallet and, and hit a ball is polo for us. So we are promoting that. We also, we are, we are encouraging all of that because that's the best way for kids to start, boys and girls, you know, and to start on a bicycle or on a wheel, or an electric wheel or, or a pony, you know, it's, or it doesn't matter the size of the polo field. So that's also you know, what, what we, are, we are looking very encouraging to in the future. What did I see the other day, Alex? I think it was either in Chicago on a local news broadcast. I saw a bunch of guys who were playing floor hockey on skateboards. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's all it takes, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, they have one wheels that look like skateboards now, but I mean, there's your arena polo right there. <laughs> right. There used to be a Chicago bike polo league, I think, at one point. Well, I started playing on, on a bike also. So that's when we were kids, we played 
we're all the day, you know, sticking bowling and playing on, on a bike. Well, it's it's the pickleball of polo. Let's just put it that way. Look where where tennis and all that kind of emerged exactly. too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, you, you you need to enlarge the base of the pyramid. So we, we we are happy with you and encouraging all of those formats. Yeah. Well, even golf. I mean, I, I think I saw you know golf was recently in decline, and I remember you know golf courses were trying to experiment and expand their base all the way to the extent of trying to open up their courses somehow during the winter time. And also, you know, enlarging the holes so people can play like soccer, golf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of football <laughs> golf in Argentina. Yeah, you know, I know frisbee golf is gaining popularity up here. So yeah, that's a good point. I, I've spoken to the gentleman that does the one wheel polo, and I've always wanted to get those things. But at the same time, it's like uh, I'm older. I don't have a small center of gravity. This is getting very risky. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would make my life better running around the polo field and managing it if I could just hop on one of those things and go. <laughs> yeah, but it's taken with the kids it's taking a lot now. Now they they, they got tournaments uh, in several parts of the world uh, with Roda, you know. So he, he had it during the World Polo Championship. He had it, uh, exhibition games and lessons. So it's great for kids to start. And it's funny because my daughter just recently asked. She just got her first taste of one of those hoverboards with two with two feet and you go back and forth, not a one wheel. Mm -hmm. And now she's asking it for Christmas and it's like, oh, you know what, maybe I'll just get her one wheel because then there's actually a legitimate sport tied to it versus <laughs> exactly. just running around my kitchen and living room. Right. Sort of thing. And you can give it a try also then. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, it's just like, well, if I'm going to get one, I might as well get two. Then we can do it together. <laughs> Start with one and see how it goes. And then <laughs> those things are the moment like before a polo match starts and all the teams get there, I mean, immediately like grooms or the kids or the players or something, they, they just canvas the peel and they're just running back mm -hmm. and forth with their foot exactly. balance and just yeah. having a good time. Yeah, maybe it is something where we should start to promote it and do a little exhibition of it for the purpose of youth players wanting to get involved. Absolutely. And then you, you play with a tennis ball so it doesn't hurt. You know, you get hit and it doesn't hurt. So it's not dangerous. And yeah. So in your eyes, when it comes to FIP, it's just not everything that's on a horse. Anything no. with a, a ball and mallet, in your exactly. opinion, is polo. Oh, and yeah. And broadening that base, as you mentioned, the pyramid is very vital. And then obviously, you know, even if people don't ultimately get it on a horse, it still makes the apex of the sport relevant. It gets you public for the sport. Yeah. You don't run a Formula One car, but you drive a car. Yeah. So you are, you know, you're into NASCAR or you know, Indianapolis or Indy cars or Formula One because why? Because you drive a car. So speaking on that, some of the conversations I've had, you mentioned Formula One racing. Do you think FIP would support anything like Formula One's Drive to Survive on Netflix? Are you familiar with that? Yep. Yep. Of course. That would be a fantastic promotion. <laughs> it was for Formula One an, an incredible promotion. So imagine what it would do for Polo. The downfall, and I've heard from some people about this, is that that show does not hold back at all. I mean, it, it shows all the negatives and personalities behind this game. That it's just like, look, it's, it's not all positive, if you will. Like, <laughs> people are at each other's throats, man. Like, the business of Formula One, it's, it's no joke. But then again, who doesn't want to see that stuff? That just adds to the drama. It's why everyone slows down on a highway when there's an accident up ahead. Do you know how many kids that never watched Formula One now are watching Formula One because they saw it on Netflix? Yeah. So there's always pros and cons in everything you do. But in his way, it's like bad publicity is good publicity in a way. Exactly. It kind of brings back that whole entire notion of things. But you're right. I mean, Formula One game sales on PlayStation and Xbox are through the roof. All of those guys that are Formula One drivers are now relevant. They're on David Letterman talk shows and things like that. Exactly. No, it's, it's good, like the FIP support. Because I know some of the players that I talk to and what have you, just like, oh, you know, they, they don't care about the positivity of it. They're just like, there's so much that goes on here that it would be entertaining to watch. There are so many characters in this game. Players, Patrons, you name it. But even walking down the path with you, Alex, in terms of just how the World Championships place and all the way down to the zones and where you've gone from six to eight countries in the first world championships and now you have upwards to 30 teams you said that are participated in across the world today the 30 teams they don't participate all of them but we had uh over 25 26 teams participating that's in, impressive uh, in, yeah 
it's growing and it's grown. And then uh, you add up to that the European Championship, which is six to eight goals. And we had uh, 10 teams participating in the European Championship. Only Europe, because of course, more teams can participate when it's six to eight than with, when it's 10 to 12, yeah. 10 to 14. But you were talking about your know, marketing. And of course, it's very different to what we do, which is the, the national associations putting it together. Yeah. Of course, they need marketing, they need sponsors. So we can attract sponsors to the sport. Then that will, you know, trickle down to national associations, to the clubs and to the polo players. But it's a different format. Today, the format is patrons. Yeah, there, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I think I was watching that Netflix thing on FIFA, uh, which mm -hmm. wasn't a positive documentary. But it did talk about the formation of FIFA and its roots and its launch it had a lot to do with Coca-Cola. And this was back, I think, in the 70s of when it took place, where Coca-Cola sponsored FIFA's, I think, grassroots youth campaign. And that really triggered their commercial footprint to help get them as big as they are today. Because I know Adidas and all of them started to follow suit mm -hmm. from there. So it's an interesting conversation. It's like we could go all day around this. But this has been great, Alex. I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. And going in, into depth because... You know, I hope our audience, you know, while majority of it, it is the polo community. You know, I do hope that those who are not get a good sense as to the background and the details that go into it. Because, you know, I'm trying to answer a lot of questions that I'm not even pertinent to unless I have you on speed dial and text. And, you know, people who are in main strips, they're, they're, they're interested. But, you know, when they think of polo, they think of the royal family. They think of pretty woman, all that kind of stuff. But when you peel back the curtain, it's a much different world than what they perceive it to be. And we're very much like any other sport, the processes of zones and going to the world championships and how it's up fairly with the horses is similar to others. We just have that extra leg of difficulty with the horses, but for the most part, we're very similar to others. Oh yeah. But this has been great, Alex. I, I hope you enjoyed the time. It's been great speaking with you and I look forward to meeting you in the future. Sure. But yeah, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. I don't know what you guys are doing or what you celebrate. We celebrate Christmas and New Year. <laughs> so there we go. There we're we're go. all here. Very nice uh, talking to you. Very interesting. Hope to be able to meet you and hope that you are able to make it to, the, to Argentina. I really do. I, it's it's going to happen. That's something on your, on your bucket list that you have <laughs> that you should have. In this industry, it's it's so small and you develop so many great friends and relationships. It's just like it's a phone call away. Mm-hmm whether it be staying at someone's farm or their property, what have you, but I would love to go to Palermo and watch the Argentine Open. You know, I know Patagonia is down there, and it's been a passion of mine to go there because that's where I feel like the world has been untouched by the hands of man to, to some degree. But it's going to happen sooner or later. Next year, November, December is the right time to do it. Patagonian summer is beautiful. So, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Alex. Thank you so much again, and have a wonderful Christmas and Happy New Year. The same to you, Danny. Nice talking to you. Take care. In 2012, the founders of Outside the Boards witnessed their first polo match and were stunned by the sport's beauty and brutality. Few sports, if any, have these combined qualities. The sport's grace, intensity, and warlike imagery create a shock and awe viewing experience like none other. Combine this with the sport's party-like atmosphere and lifestyle and you have a recipe for success. Today, the sport has yet to witness its full potential. The industry is fragmented, riddled with politics and inexperience. Outside the Boards was purposely designed to change all that and bring clarity to the sport by introducing best practices, insights, trends, and consulting services to industry stakeholders and interested brands so that they can reach their marketing potential and better navigate the sport. Whether you're a club seeking custom sponsorship and marketing solutions or simply looking for strategic advice, we encourage you to contact us today or subscribe to gain access to industry insights. Visit us at www.outsidetheboards.com or to learn more or email us at info at outsidetheboards.com. Now we have reached the part of the show where we address outside the boards issues affecting the sport of polo with the sharing of insights, ideas, and best practices towards solving everyday marketing, branding, and sponsorship problems, avoiding bad habits, or helping to navigate through new trends and how to best leverage those opportunities. Hi everyone, Danny O'Leary here. And on this episode's insights, I wanted to talk a little bit about sponsor targeting. 
And I, I bring this up just because at Oak Brook Polo, I feel like we're constantly seeing an evolution in our sponsors and some of the brands that have been contacting us or we've been reaching out to and taking meetings and so on and so forth. And when I go out and targeting and when I make my list every year, I have to say I'm not really looking at the overall global or U.S. sponsorship space when it's related to polo, just because it's very different from market to market. If I look at Santa Barbara, if I look at Texas, I mean, you do see some consistency overall, but the brands have a tendency to be very different from one to the other. So I kind of take that approach as my last in terms of a comparison. And what I do every year is I take a look at who has sponsored last year's festivals, sports, and so on and so forth. And I take a look at to see where the cross pollination is, who's spending more, if it's over the course of sports teams and festivals and music events and so on and so forth to see consistency overall. That's one tactic I do. The next tactic after that, I see where some of these brands and companies are headquartered, most likely. And when I find that they're more proximity to my polo club or within the same town or close, those might be my lowest hanging fruit because they probably have more of a propensity and corporate responsibility to invest in their local communities as to where their employees reside, where they do most of their business, and so on and so forth. So that's typically the tactic and approach that I go about. And I feel like I have a strong obligation to target local businesses and help them increase their business and help them with their sales and reach out to a broader and more of a diverse demographic. And I will tell you, Polo is a very diverse demographic. I'm not sure what the demographics have been other polo clubs, but when I look at my own, it's incredibly diverse. And that is a huge selling point on our end. And it it continues to do that year after year after year. And it becomes a great story for us to tell. So when I do all of that local and the propensity from other sports and entertainment properties and so on and so forth, then I cross pollinate to see, is there a connection between some of those brands and have they invested or currently invested in polo or other equestrian sports? Because usually that's kind of the nail in the coffin, because that is a great indicator that someone, let's say a brand in another state, in another market, has shown success with the polo that they too can be successful in their own market. And one such way to look at it is in the areas of spirits, you know, alcoholic brands, which is highly regional. If you're like us in Illinois, you have the brands and then you have the distributors. And a lot of times the distributor has a lot of pull into the market because everything is about moving product and trafficking product as much as they can. So in that case, you might see a brand in the alcohol business, you know, sponsoring a polo club or a tournament in a completely another area, let alone another country, but aren't not doing it here in the U.S. And in some cases, those brand managers and what have you make that connection with their colleagues in that market and discover that this is probably a viable option for them to be here in their particular market. So that's a little bit about targeting. I kind of wanted to share with you guys since, you know, we're in the business right now of, you know, coming up on our summer season. We're in the business of closing some of the deals that we've been talking to or some last minute conversations before our season gets started. And I wanted to have that conversation with you to see how you guys are targeting. And uh, hopefully you can walk away with some insights in terms of how to approach sponsorship these days. But thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Enjoy. Bye. That was a great episode. What is the one thing you learned from today's conversation? If this episode had an impact on you in some way, then I encourage you to visit and subscribe to our website at OutsideTheBoards.com for more episodes and interviews with incredible guests. Thanks for stopping by, my friends, and hope to see you on the polo field.